since November um, and the happening in Chennai, um, water security is kind of a focus. And, um, you know, water security means for us that we take care of excesses when there is a flood, but also when there is a drought. How to do that? We hope to um, give an example, a living example within Oroville, which has been in existence for the last 47 years, and which we look at it as a kind of a laboratory um, in a small scale. We try it out whether a decentralized settlement, not the macro level, but on a micro level, can set an example and see what it can do. Um, we are part of a region, a bioregion, and on the right side you see actually uh, two major landmarks, the Kalivelli tank and then a little bit below down the um, white speck which is Pondicherry. The circle is the little speck where Oroville is situated. The blue specks indicate village water tanks. It's extremely interesting that the majority of these tanks were constructed, implemented, and were functional about 1,000 years ago. They were built by under the Shola kings. And they all uh, overflow one to the other to the big blue speck, which is the Kali Valley. 1,000 years ago, there was no Google Earth, no GPS, and it's a real engineering feature that we have there in that bioregion. A small introduction to Oroville. Um, this was the beginning in 1968, and the first task of the community involved environmental rehabilitation on an empty landscape. It evolved 20 years later by planting about 4 million trees. We lost some in the cyclone, but we're still planting. We're expanding the program, many spin-offs, and it has really created a micro uh, climate. The second task was securing a sustainable water resources program or project. The canyon that we see on the slide is man-made. It's due to uh, def uh, deforestation, started 200, 250 years ago, first by the British, then the French, then the local population. And since we're on a laterite soil, um, it cuts, whenever there is a rainfall, it cuts like a cake. And everything goes to the backside in the Bay of Bengal. What we did is systematically um, plugging, making dams, and making sure that we kept as long as possible the rainwater so that it could infiltrate and replenish the water table. The other aspect which we had to take care of was integrating as much sustainable technologies. There was no infrastructure. Um, we had no electricity line, so we had a chance to develop that aspect. It evolved in checking and testing and researching all the possible renewable energies which were actually applicable to our climatic um, region. A small overview of Oroville, we have a five square kilometer inner city, which is the circle with the four zones. Um, we have a fluctuating population of about 2,500. In tourist season, it goes up to 10,000. We operate about 200 underground wells, bore wells, um, afforestation mentioned already, and then renewable energy. We have in the south of India two big wind generators, which produce all the energy that we use actually in the community. We operate also 500 kilowatt of solar PVs, mostly decentralized, and we hope to add in the next few years another 500 kilowatt. The outer circle, which you see, is the green belt, and that's about 15 square kilometer. 
The land, most of the land, we own about 3,700 acres, is owned by a foundation which was constituted by an act of parliament. So we have a link with the government of India there. How is or what a resource context? We presently are dependent fully on groundwater because it's the most easy way of extracting and providing uh, water for the people who live around. However, we have continuously declining aquifers. Despite the fact that we planted so many trees, we found out that instead of water table going up, it's going down. And the reason is that none of the aquifers are owned by the people where they live. They go kilometers further, and further away, the pumping is heavily for sugarcane, for all kind of intensive agriculture practices. We have also, since we're on the coast, we have salinity intrusion. So after a couple of decades, we found out that depending on a single water resource, which is the groundwater, the bore wells, has absolutely does not give us a water security. We initiated um, a program, a project, a study, and we agreed within the community that multi-sourcing water strategy uh, would be a necessity and a solution. We have to wean ourselves out of the easy practice of bore wells. And the two aspects of which I'm involved in is capturing surface water. Another group is working on uh, desalinization for drinking water. And then we try to retain uh, a cluster of wells which are relatively healthy and sound and which could uh, give us a backup. This, together with a program of water saving and especially recyc uh, recycling practices, we hope to initiate in the next few decades. The major parameters before we started that we took in consideration was that we um, stick ourselves to a time frame. We took 20 years and the population at that time in 2032, if we have a growth of 3% like we have at the moment, we are a little bit over 4,000 people. If we have a higher growth of about 10%, we will reach about 15,000 people. We checked our water consumption and we believe that we actually can reach 166 liter per capita per day. If we do consistent recycling, we could actually reduce to 107 liter per capita per day. We did a fairly detailed rainfall um, research. We have an average of about 1,300 yearly and this was done over a 40 years daily rainfall data. However, we have an effective rainfall because in that rainfall you have trace uh, rain. We have actually only 1,176 on an average. There is an evaporation rate and that's a catch of more than 2,000 millimeter a year. That has to be actually counteracted if we do surface water um, uh, a surface water project. We took land occupation, the high ratio and the low ratio. And then the runoff coefficient, we estimated a high one and a low one. With these parameters, we started to actually start to research and design something which would lead to a surface harvesting or rainwater harvesting program. These are the topographic features and the challenges for drainage management. We sit on a ridge, a height of about 52 meters above sea level, and it's there where we would actually like to capture. That's an extra difficulty. How would we like to do that? In the center, we have actually a sacred building 
of Oracle. We did like in ancient time, instead of going the modern way where you do a plaza or a mall or something in the middle of the city, we dedicated the center of the city to a sacred place. And that sacred place, we believe, should be surrounded, obviously, by some water. We want to include, the aim is water security through surface rainwater capturing. And the aspects that we want to incorporate, and these are three levels which have to come together. They must have been done previously in ancient time, I'm sure about it, but we would like to do it in a modern city. We would like to incorporate the symbolic meaning, uh, following ancient tradition by having water around. We would like to design, on the highest point, um, moving and flowing water. We would like also to integrate, especially aesthetic, but including all the essential environmental elements, which is definitely not easy in a tropical climate. And then the lake or the water body, if we ever manage, has to be practical. It cannot just be aesthetical. It has to supply the upcoming city or the settlement with water. So we have defined around uh, the sacred body, which is uh, Matramandir, several drainage areas. And the pink one is the highest, and then it goes down to the light green. We have about 365 acres which we can drain around Matramandir, which is the soul of Oroville. Just a small uh, note, side note, in the front you have um, amphitheater with a lotus symbol in which were placed in the beginning of Oroville soil of all the uh, countries in the world. But what was interesting, in the 80s when this was built, there was already a huge water tank included for uses of water for the gardens. So how do we envision that surface water drainage capture? We, would, we do believe that with a volume of 300,000 cubic meter, with a surface around Matrimandir of about 60,000 square meter, a varying depth from four to five meter, we calculated the yearly infiltration, the yearly evaporation, look how high it is. The good thing is that there is a massive overflow in that one, which we could use. So the whole thing would be supplied by an effective drainage area of about uh, 3,560 acres, as I said, bordering Matramandir. And this would be sufficient to supply 95% of the animal water demand for a population of about 15,000. We are slowly trying to implement that one. In the drainage uh, area, there need to be channels. You need to capture, when the rain falls, you need to capture uh, the rain when it's there and lead it to a kind of a water body. This would be done like we are doing in some places in Oroville already. Um, it would contribute to the aesthetic beauty of the surrounding place. There would have to be silt capturing ponds because there will be a lot of silt, so uh, it needs to be having uh, siltation ponds which could be incorporated on the way to the lake. Yeah. How we would like to see the lake is not in one piece, because the topography does not really allow it, but we would like to do it in a stepway, a terrace lake. And um, we would incorporate, the last one would be a lake for the overflow. From there, from the overflow lake, which would be quite uh, voluminous, we would actually pump back and create a flow in the whole system. Um, it is necessary that there is a secondary uh, storage tank for the overflow. That's part and parcel of the whole scheme. 
it's difficult to find examples of uh, step lakes. That's the best that I could come up with. It's not in India. It's not. Uh, it's somewhere. But it would look a little bit like that. Only you could have space in between in the water bodies. You could have actually a lot of space in between. Uh, mm, this is the last picture of the the project which we want to, which we are actually going to implement for the water capturing uh, surface water and if you walk around Oroville you come unexpectedly to places where people uh, have used real simple and creative means uh, to capture rainwater and this is just one example of that one it's really beautiful um, the next area where we have done quite a bit of work is in natural wastewater treatment systems. We started in 1984 when we tried actually to provide to the community a system which was not expensive to build, which did not require high maintenance and which could actually work without input of um, mechanical power. Um, this has led us to more than 30 years of research and implementation. And I give you a small overview. This is actually the first, one of the first systems that we included, 1989. You have in the background the planted filter, which we still use at that moment. And then in the front, a beautiful pond with uh, water lilies. I give you an example of how it works. We started with small systems, uh, two cubic meter, not more. And the resulting aim was to try to um, completely integrate it in an aesthetical way within the landscape. And in several places, we managed that very well. The main uh, effort went in through neutralizing uh, the smell. We all know that wastewater, if you use it, and if it comes to the surface, produces a smell. You cannot sell a wastewater treatment system next to a house which sells. So a lot of effort over the years went in trying to find ways and means and methods to uh, absorb the smell and make the water uh, reusable at the end. And I give you some of the examples. We worked with partners uh, all over India, and one of the most interesting uh, experiments was in the city of Butch, in the district of Kutch, where um, we got allocated a piece of land belonging to the government where there was a pumping station. And you can see nicely the layout for about 40 cubic meter. You have in the front the settler, the baffle tank, anaerobic filter, and then the two big spaces on the right are actually for the planted filter. When everything was ready, this was uh, the renovated place which worked. Um, building the system was not too difficult. It was just convincing the apartment owners that they would have a treatment plant in front of them. That took a lot of social effort and uh, convincing. Today, it's a pilgrimage place within the city. People come, look at it. We uh, mastered um, there completely the effect of um, odor. There is no odor involved, and the people use the place during the morning and the afternoon. The water is used for um, renovating and planting trees along an inflow channel to the lake in Butch of about one and a half kilometer. And this is the planting which has taken place. It's actually an example that you can implement in the city small natural wastewater treatment plants um, in relatively small isolated places. The place is not more than 1,200 square meter. And it contributes to beauty, it's aesthetic, and the water is purified, treated, and reused right on the place. Um, 
huge improvement to cutting and pumping the sewage away out of the city, treating it or draining it in a river. But there is an effort involved, obviously. Um, it's interesting because um, we moved away from the planted filter um, for two reasons. First of all, we had some maintenance problems. We found that we had quite a bit of clogging problems on the planted filter. Um, Fabio will tell more tomorrow about that one. But the other main important thing was we were moving slowly into the system was mature enough. The first system here. Was more or less fine-tuned and really effective. We were stuck if we wanted to go into an urban landscape with the space of the planted filter, which is quite big and which is not that cheap to build any longer. So in 2008, we stumbled upon, within Oroville, upon a device which is called a vortex. And the vortex is a replica of a tornado, which happens uh, in the Americas very regularly. We managed to duplicate that one. It happens on land, but it happens also naturally in the water body. It was not something that we invented. It existed already in the 19th century when an Austrian um, forester Schauberger um, observed and described the vortex. And we had uh, a small unit who used it for water purification, fresh water, for augmenting the quality of the fresh water. So we thought, if it works for fresh water, maybe let's try that it works also for changing and recycling wastewater. Um, we did that. And we did a solid program of three years of research with all kinds of instruments. We moved to more sophisticated tests, dyes and things like that. Finally, we constructed the first small household wastewater for a couple of hundred liters. And what we found is that it was so promising because what the system does, it necessitates a pump, a small pump, to actually make that circling movement below in the tube and then create that beautiful vortex. It's really beautiful. Once we had the basics, we started to implement it uh, slowly within the community, which is the testing ground for us, Oroville. We did quite a bit of implementation and research in CSR, two systems all kind of tryouts, trying to figure out. The conclusion was that by actually, let me go back, by actually turning the water, you oxygenate the water. And then we did one really beautiful model. We used prefabricated ferrocements for underground, and then in a new apartment building within Oroville, Citadin, for 10 KLD a day, we managed actually to create an extremely beautiful aesthetic example of how to recycle wastewater on a site uh, of habitation without the hassle of other and beautifully integrated. All the systems were all the primary and secondary recycling systems were built out of these tanks, placed underground, and the only visible um, feature was a small tank where the vortex water comes in, goes to a small other overflow tank, and then goes back to an underground storage tank. They have actually more than enough water for irrigation and plantation and making the whole area super green. We pushed the whole system further and we got opportunities to place 
much bigger systems. One of them is in Bangalore, in VBHC, where we did uh, 750 and 410 with vortexes. Uh, also, fairly nice integrated within the landscape. The latest, what we're trying to do is to go away from acrylic and use, because they have the acrylic pipes are uh, imported from China. And we try, we actually found a manufacturer in Bangalore who does pieces of curved glass. So the next thing will be glass. It's much more durable. It doesn't uh, uh, give that, after a while, that yellow, uh, brownish tint. So we're moving and trying to get new experiments going on the material. We are sure that the device works. Um, I think Oroville has played its role as an initiator, and it's now on the community, and especially the landscape architects, to use that device, to push it further, to get more information whether it works, yes or no. That's it. I thank you so much for your attention.